Good evening and welcome. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator at Loudoun County Public Library and your host for this evening's program on landscape photography with Vladimir Grab Grablev. Feel free to send me any comments or questions you might have during the program by typing them in the chat box and I can relay them to Vladimir at the end of his presentation. When Vladimir moved to the United States, what he knew of its landscape was what he saw in movies back home. He wanted to find what he called the real America, so he set out visiting the national parks, and what he found has inspired his photography ever since. Vladimir's award-winning images have appeared in regional outdoor magazines, internet publications, and newspapers, including Arlington Magazine, Around Reston Magazine, and Richmond Times-Dispatch. His photographs have been exhibited in local and international galleries, business venues, and private collections. When he's not taking photographs, Vladimir is a professional software engineer. So welcome, Vladimir. Thank you, Lorraine, and good evening, everybody. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here and talk about one special national park. Well, all national parks are special, but Shenandoah is where my passion to photography sparked seven years ago. And since then, this is my playground, outdoor studio, and an art classroom. So today I would like to guide you through these mountains and visit some of my favorite places. Skyland Drive, the famous scenic road and the backbone of traveling through the park will be our guide. Uh, we'll start near mile zero at the north and making stops along the way visit three districts. Upon entering each one, I will be briefly covering the notable characteristics that we landscape photographers should keep in mind when planning our adventures. So, off we go with northern district. There are a few things that you need to keep in mind about it. Um, it's busy, especially during the fall season, so plan ahead if you are determined to get here. Lines at Front Royal can be very long, um, so arriving before sunrise could save you a lot of time. And finally, this district is generous with overlooks both to the east and to the west, which means opportunities for sunrises and sunsets. And Without any further ado, we'll stop at the first overlook at the Skyland Drive, the Shenandoah Valley Overlook. I always thought of it as an introduction to Shenandoah for the first time visitors. And for that reason, I never stopped here in morning hours. But in attempt to study places more thoroughly, I changed that attitude and suddenly discovered a beautiful light that is particularly attractive during the winter time when air is dry and clean. Nevertheless, it took me several trips before I settled on this panoramic composition and got the right weather conditions. And this is an important lesson. Shenandoah does not reveal its beauty at once. Return to same places at different time, weather and seasons and you will discover much more than just one view. Like with this image, during the day, it's pretty, but ordinary. Even in the evening, this setting, the setting sun will be illuminating other side of these little hills on the left. And for my composition, I wanted the tree line at the bottom to be in the shadow. So the balance will be shifted from the bottom of the image toward the center to the valley itself. And this is definitely possible only in the morning because in the evening, these trees are illuminated by the setting sun as well. So that's the lesson. Keep it in mind and come back to seemingly familiar places here. Now let's travel a few miles further to our next stop at Goonie Manor Overlook. It is located on the west slope of the mountain ridge and offers spectacular views of Shenandoah Valley with opportunities to capture a colorful sunset. But I encourage you to come here soon after the sunrise. This photograph is an example of what you might find. Use a telephoto lens to explore the valley and pick out smaller, more intimate details playing on the contrast of shadow and light. 
Um, for that exercise, I usually put my camera on a tripod and keep image stabilization on. This allows me to keep the camera steady and move, not use the cable release. So I simply compose the frame and push the button when ready. Um, another uh, useful piece of equipment at this location is polarizing filter. With such a cute side light, this filter can create additional accent um, that is very difficult, if even possible, to recreate in Lightroom or Photoshop. All right, now it's time for a little hike to Compton Peak. Note that official guides rate this trail as moderately difficult, but this would be the case if you decide to go to the eastern viewpoint. But I personally found no views there. Um, although there is very unusual geological formation that worth exploring. Um, from the photography standpoint, the primary interest would be at the west. All right, uh, here I have to confess. I like sunrises much more than sunsets. Uh, some people say, well, both look the same, so why you bother waking up when it's still dark outside? Well, to me, there is a big difference. First of all, for that reason that it's too early, you avoid crowds and have most of places self or share it with a fellow photographer who might give you some unexpected idea or share some knowledge about camera or the view itself. Uh, second, after the night, the air is usually cooler and more transparent, which helps with visibility and essentially make your pictures better. And lastly, I personally find it easier to wait for the coming of the light in the morning rather than chasing its disappearance at the end of the day. For this place, unfortunately, it means that I have to wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, with views almost to the north, you can catch the sun in your photos only when these are long, in the middle of the summer, and that means that the sunrise is early. But once in a while, I keep coming back here and never regret that. Um, from the compositional standpoint, consider using a wide angle lens here to use rocks as a background, uh, I'm sorry, as a foreground and capture sufficient amount of sky in the background. Uh, keep in mind that dynamic range here could be high. Uh, rocks will be dark, sky will be bright. So you either should use graduated filter in front of your lens or bracket your shot and merge them to HDR on your computer later. Okay, now let's return to the Skyline Drive and check the range view overlook. Okay. The speciality of this place is view to the south. If you look in that direction, all the mountain ridges to the horizon are in Shenandoah. Uh, get your telephones, uh, telephoto lens ready. Um, I found wide angle photographs from this location not so appealing. Um, and telephoto lens is actually producing much uh, better and more interesting images. Like in this example, um, although I didn't zoom all the way to the mountains and kept my lens at 70 millimeters, the widest it can do. Um, and this allowed me to include beautiful moving clouds and juxtapose them um, and blue sky pat and patches um, to the mountain slope, uh, which is more yellow and golden tone. Uh, note the elements proportion. I settled on this ratio to balance the image and not let mountains to overpower the sky. Plus it gives some more realistic feeling of what you might actually see uh, from this spot. Uh, so you're in the open space and you have a lot of sky in front of you. So looking a little bit upward is something more natural when you're there. And this makes the photo more, I would say, appropriate uh, to the location. But there is one more thing about this overlook. Besides an open sky images, there is a potential for some more intimate landscapes. Right behind you, across the Skyland Drive, the mountain slope 
is filled with rocks and trees. With a telephoto lens, you could frame a nice forest scene while actually standing on the pavement. Isn't that nice? Uh, so I encourage you to check this place during the fall season when trees are changing the colors. Just take pictures of uh, wide vistas, turn around and check that uh, side of the wall uh, behind the Skyland Drive. Now, let's hit the road again and go just beyond that point on the Skyland Drive, that patch of road that you see on the photo. That will be a little devil stairs overlook. And here you have abundance of options. From here, you can witness gorgeous sunrises, explore details of the landscape with your telephoto lens, or even frame an awesome dead tree by the road with wide angle lens. If you come here for the sunrise, I encourage you to stay longer and photograph valley with a telephoto lens in the front light. I so often see people leaving overlooks right after the sunrise as if the show is over. No, not at all. Stay for 20 minutes longer and you will have a chance to capture beautiful silhouettes of the rolling hills in front of you. If you have clouds, make them part of the image as I did here. If your sky is clear, zoom all the way to the valley and capture details. If you're lucky and you see fog down in the valley, you are set for dreamy photos of rural Virginia. Note that on the back of the camera, though, these images might look dull and not so colorful, but don't let that discourage you. Take them home and boost the contrast in Lightroom. Just Make sure that you have your camera settings set to the raw images. Although that should be always your default settings, capture images in raw. Now, let's combine an overlook with a trail. Pass Mountain is a sunset overlook, but even in the morning, views from here could be attractive. This is especially true true during the winter time when cold air is clear and transparent. That in turn changes the quality of colors too. Blue shadows on the mountain slopes are more saturated and complement golden light on the peaks. Note that in this instance, I decided to include more land in the frame and the overall feeling of the image is a little bit different. But since I had brighter colors, I figured that it might work for this composition. So once you finish with capturing your images from this overlook, check the trail that you're standing on. Um, walk it. It's so short that in five minutes, you will find yourself back on the overlook. Unless if you wouldn't stop in woods to photograph some forest scenes, uh, there are a lot of um, pine cones, uh, rocks, trees, and little scenes that might actually make you stay there for a little bit longer. And with that, we are leaving the Northern District and enter the Central. This section of the park is awesome. Uh, from the entrance, you can quickly drive to three wonderful sunrise overlooks. Three are um, actually maybe in 15 minutes uh, from the entrance or even less. So it will take you no time uh, in the morning to get there. Um, and you have abundance of options on these overlooks. Uh, there are a lot of places to see in this district, uh, a lot of trails or hikes and things to do. But that means that it's busy and lines and Thornton Gap entrance can still be long, almost as long as the Front Royal, uh, which is not an issue, of course, if you arrive before the sunrise. Our first point of interest here will be the Maurice Rock hike. Uh, the trail is very popular and heavily used, but this changes when the weather goes bad. I mean, rain and snow and especially snow. Uh, 
you see the beauty of this location is that you can get here even when skyline drive is closed and on a snow day the hike could turn it could turn into something unusual and wonderful experience like in my case uh, for this photograph, I actually shot a backstage video that you can find on YouTube if you search for my name. Um, that day, Rangers closed the drive and more snow was expected in the afternoon. So I met just a few people on the trail and had all these rocks for myself. By the time I came there, clouds started to roll in and block the views, but I didn't care. Uh, I was really attracted to this set of boulders in the snow and trees with covered, uh, trees covered with the ice. Um, I also liked that the background melts in the distance. That was a cloud that was right behind those trees. And that added additional dimension to the uh, image. I think it wouldn't be possible to photograph it on a regular day simply because of footprints and because of people walking back and forth. But that's another reason why you should keep this location in mind uh, when you have Skyland Drive closed, but you really want to go to the park and photograph some winter scenes. Uh, what's important is that you should keep in mind that the trail is slippery, so keep your crampons or cleats ready and weird because this is an essential attribute there. Now, let's talk about one important technical aspect. When you photograph scenes like this, do not trust your camera light meters right away. You probably have this experience. You photograph fresh snow on an overcast day and all the images look dark and muddy. This is because your cameras read the light from the scene and average it. It works in most cases, but not when your subject is truly bright. Cameras get confused, underestimate the light, and turn your white snow gray. There are two ways to address that. One is to use exposure compensation function that should be described in your camera manuals, and another is to set the exposure using histograms. I'm always using this last approach. Here's how I'm doing this. I set the camera to the manual mode, dial in my desired aperture, and turn on histogram on the camera screen. Then I start changing the shutter speed until the last color almost touches the right side. I prefer to see individual channels, but you could use RGB histogram uh, as an example on the right, which is also works in most cases. Now, let's move to the next stop, which is not only photogenic, but has a unique feature, a tunnel, which is not only attractive, but also a great subject to learn how your lenses work. Here, the tunnel is represented close to the real light. I used normal telephoto, well, normal lens, not telephoto, that designed to convey things close to what we perceive with our eyes. My goal was to portray this winter scene with icicles atop of the north portal and glowing light at the end of the tunnel. I took several exposures to capture details inside the tunnel and merged them to HDR in Lightroom, and that worked. But a couple of details kept me thinking. Um, I wanted to have a little bit more icicles, and the exit at the end of the tunnel seemed too small to my eye. So eight months later, I came back to the same location with another lens to capture this. With almost three times longer focal length, I managed to compress the space inside the tunnel and get more orange glow against even more icicles. Of course, for that image, I had to walk back, but the final result still resembles the first photograph. 
and here they are side by side. I think this is quite striking example of how choice of lenses can impact the image. So your telephoto lens is not only a way to zoom on something really far, uh, but also a good tool to control the perspective and achieve some artistic goal. Also note that there is no winner or loser here. Both photographs have their merits and serve different goals. I personally like them both and can tell which is better, although this preference might change and swing back and forth depending on my mood. And I can say that I like this image more and this less, and next day I change my mind. Okay. Next spot. It is also quite popular, although many people confuse it to its big brother. And that big brother is called Stony Man. The little Stony Man is located at lower elevation and in just half a mile from a small parking area not far away from Stony Man Overlook. There are two viewpoints there, one at lower and another above it. Uh, I took this image from uh, the second one standing next to a small pool on the edge of the cliff. And as you might guess, that was a cloudy day and I had to wait for quite a long time uh, before view cleared enough so I can see some patch in the valley. And this is another lesson and one important reason why tripods are our best friends. When you compose your shot, every little detail is important. What you have on the left, what you have on the right, do you have more sky or do you want to include more background? Uh, what is your focal length and so on? And you cannot do all that with your camera in your hands if you have to wait for X number of minutes. And that's why we have tripods. They are doing this job for us. They are holding our composition and keep our cameras ready for actual exposure when the moment is right. And that, that could be anything. It's not necessarily the weather or clouds. You might have people walking in front of you and you probably waiting for sunrise or something like that. So tripods are quite important tool and I'm heavily relying on those. Okay, next location. I want to talk about White Oak Canyon. And this area is famous for its set of waterfalls and the mountain river. If you hike down to the canyon from the Skyland Drive, the way back up could be challenging. Fortunately, there is another parking area at the bottom, right at the boundary of the park. So if you travel with your friends and you have another car, you can leave it there and avoid hiking up altogether. Just have one car at the Skyland Drive, another at the bottom and hike all the way down uh, visiting all the waterfalls and capturing images of the river. But even without that, you will find a lot of places where you can photograph charming little landscapes at the lower elevation. For example, I found this spot in just like a few minutes from the parking lot. Uh, just don't forget your polarizing filter. Uh, this piece of gear can play an important role here. Uh, when you deal with rocks and reflections, it might make significant difference. Another consideration is the shutter speed. Uh, I know that many photographers like to use long exposures and turn water into silky mist, but I personally prefer to retain some texture in the moving water. My observation is that with wide angle lens, you should not go beyond one second or preferably stay at one sixth or one fourth. Sometimes when I don't have enough light, I even decide to open up my aperture with risk of losing some definition in the background or bump ISO 
and introduce some notes. But to tell you the truth, neither harmed my images so far. Uh, modern cameras and software are really good with handling noise, and some softness in the background could add some atmosphere and depth to the scenes like that. So don't be afraid. Experiment with your settings, and if you have to make some unusual choices, just make them. Uh, you might not regret and actually like the result. Now, next stop will be easy. Just an overlook with a view to the highest mountain in Shenandoah. Unless you decide to walk a few steps on the trail at the left corner of the overlook, um, after which, well, there is a rock up, uh, after which it's named, the Crescent Rock. Um, this spot is still on my list uh, for the evening. Uh, so I saw it only in the morning and during the daytime. But since it's located on the west side of the mountains, it's probably a very good uh, point to see wonderful sunsets. But even in the morning, you might find it very attractive as I did on that freezing cold morning a few years ago. Uh, if you decide to come here, you can leave your telephoto glass behind. Uh, the whole point of coming uh, to this point is to include this geological formation in your composition. And for that, you need a wide angle lens. Try setting your tripod low to visually move the rock closer to the mountain. And of course, without moving water, you are not limited with your shutter speeds. So you can set your desired aperture, um, maybe increase it if you want to have more depth of field and adjust the exposure time as needed. Note that in the morning hours, you will be standing in the shadow. So on your raw images, the foreground will be quite dark. Take your captures in the Lightroom and use brush, carefully painting over some rocks and add some more exposure. And this will give you ability to achieve a more natural look uh, that you actually experience and what you perceive when you stand there in person. Okay, let's explore more rocks at the bear fence. This hike is rather short, but could be challenging as it involves some rock climbing. On the other hand, the geology here is simply wonderful. Jagged rocks pointed upward under the same angle make for a wonderful composition. And here you will find a lot of colorful colonies of lichens. So all this will make a good recipe for a fun photo adventure. Views from this spot are great, so you can decide if you want to take your telephoto lens or leave it behind. I usually prefer one or another, depending on the particular goal in mind. Um, I really don't like to carry all my gear and scramble these steep rocks, um, so it's a little bit easier. But if you decide to go with wide angle, um, make sure that you, that, that you have the widest uh, lens possible uh, as the place is very tight. Uh, so you have to frame your shots with rocks really close to the lens. Um, and for the same reason, consider manual focusing. Um, not on the closest point to your lens, but on the hyperfocal distance. Uh, this technique might be a game changer in situations like this and result in sharp photos that otherwise would not be possible. This topic is technical enough to take significant time and not fit in this presentation, but fortunately you can find a plethora of information in the internet on this subject. Just search for the term hyperfocal distance. As for now, Let's move to the next location, which happens to be an easy one again. And here at the South River Overlook, I really found not of the view, 
with the tree. This maple is simply gorgeous. I found it at the end of October on a rainy day when park was almost empty. And as much as I love this photograph, I still think that it could be better if I would follow my own rules. You see, this image was made handheld. Uh, it was that rare case when I did not use the tripod and paid certain price for that. First, with the tripod, it would be easier to find the right angle of view, specifically be one step to the left. So the road in the distance will be a little bit separated from the tree trunk. And second, without tripod, it was more difficult to focus on that hyperfocal distance, which I mentioned earlier. And as the result, the grass in front of the tree close to the edge of the frame is slightly soft. That would not be an issue if I close the aperture to some higher value, but that would slow down my shutter speed and the whole image would be ruined because of the motion blur. These are, of course, minor issues, and I'm glad that they don't really ruin the image. But what if they would? So now I'm trying to follow my rules ev for every important subject, uh, no matter what conditions are. So lesson learned. And on that note, I would like to say that we are leaving the central district and entering the southern one. This part of the Shenandoah is the least visited. Uh, I think partially because of its relative remoteness uh, from Washington metropolitan area and partially due to its seemingly less prominent attractions. This is due to to the fact that some of these gems are not so apparent. Um, and because of that, as you can guess, both Swift Run and Rockfish Gap stations received less traffic and you can significantly save time by entering into the park from these points. Also note one uh, more national park nearby, Blue Ridge Parkway, and one additional interesting location and new, newly opened Blue Ridge Tunnel. That is great both as an outdoor experience and as a photography subject. All right, our first stop here will be at the Loft Mountain Overlook. Get your telephoto lens ready. In the morning hours, haze and fog glow in front light and lend a magical effect on these mountains. Once you start using your telephoto lens in the front line, one accessory will be very helpful, a lens hood. This simple and inexpensive attachment will shield the glass from direct sunlight and protect your images from undesired flares and contrast reduction. When capture your images, try to focus not only on shapes, and your composition, but also on the quality of the light. Pay attention to its color shape. Is it more blue and cold or yellow and warm? Take a note of that or even write it down somewhere so you have your impressions from the location. Later, when you open these captures in the Lightroom, take these notes and adjust temperature accordingly. Temperature and tint on the images might make big difference and reflect your actual experience compared to what your camera captured. After all, cameras are capturing only physical light and don't take into the account our human um, perception of the reality. And our goal as landscape photographers to fill this gap and connect mechanical capture with emotional context. Okay, my next location is one of the district's gems. Doyle's River Falls is not the easiest hike, but the destination is totally worth it. Uh, at the end, you will have not one, 
but two charming cascades with a lot of compositional opportunities. So far, this photograph of the Upper Falls is my absolute favorite, not only from this location, but probably from the entire district. Waterfalls are fed by rain and snow, so today's weather defines the water level tomorrow. And that summer, rains were scarce. Um, and I've got just a modest flow. Um, that, in fact, worked to my advantage. Uh, the sky was covered with thin layer of clouds that diffused the light and illuminated rocks and grasses, which became essentially my primary subject of the scene. Bright strings of the water act mostly as a decoration to these settings. I also like the lines of the rock that, along with shadows, create an illusion of something like number two drawn across the frame. If you will keep looking at the image for some time, you might see it. And once you see it, your eyes will start following this path and keep your mind inside the frame. Also notice the portrait orientation of the photograph. For the long time, I was composing my images horizontally, thinking that landscape orientation is called so as most suitable for landscape photography. And that was a mistake. Once I stopped thinking that way, and gave myself more compositional freedom, I discovered that some subjects that I struggled with earlier look much better and more appealing and more interesting in this vertical format. Today, I even previsualize my images in portrait orientation much more often than I do so in landscape one. Now, a couple of technical details here, uh, because description on the right might look a little bit odd to you. Uh, this photograph is made on a medium format color negative film with ISO 400, which allows me to keep the shutter speed in the range of one second. And that gives us a hint that this place could be in relatively low light, even during the daytime. And you might want to set higher ISO on your camera or open uh, your aperture a little bit. Another important aspect is the focal length. Uh, so you see 90 millimeters here, but uh, since this is medium format, it translates in approximately 45 millimeters of full frame cameras. So you can easily leave your telephoto lens in your car as you will not need it in this location. And I also encourage you not to stop at this. Um, cascades, but go a little bit further as there is another waterfall just a few minutes down the trail. Now, let's take a look at another waterfall. Just a few miles further on the Skyland Drive, you will find a trailhead to another gem, the Jones Run Falls. This hike seems a little bit easier than the previous one, but there is one stream crossing that, after heavy rains, might be a bit challenging. And here's another vertical composition. I think it's also quite unusual, too. Most images of waterfalls offer unobstructed view or clear details, but I don't remember seeing many photographs that include environment or represent our experience when we see these places in person. That day, I decided to experiment and make not only artistic, but also a documentary image. If you would go to this place, I am sure you will see this exact view just a few steps before you come out into the open. I set my camera right on the side of the trail and used my normal lens that rendered the scene close to what we see with our eyes. Did that work? I don't know. Landscape photography is a subjective art. I personally like it, not just because it's a memory of my experience, but because it invites me to be inside the image. It's what 
uh, you actually see when you approach the waterfall. And this is the view that is easily accessible to everybody. So the lesson to us here is not to restrain ourselves with classic views or established rules, but follow your emotions and feelings. Capture things that you are attracted to, not necessarily those that you see from other photographers or where they actually setting up the camera. You don't have to stand next to them to have exactly the same image. And if you feel so, just follow your instincts. All right, uh, let's have a little break and enjoy a sunrise at Murman's River Overlook. I think that there is no need to tell you what kind of views you should expect here. The image speaks for itself, but as much as I love sunrises, it is not that often that I walk away with something really pleasing like this one. First of all, such conditions are not frequent, at least when you have a day job and no opportunity to spend every morning in the park. Coming across the proper weather is a big luck. And when this happens, you better be ready as there is a number of challenges that are waiting to ruin your photos. Most common is flare. Sometimes it's okay, but in most cases, it's a technical defect that will not look good. And if you have sun in your frame like that, you must probably going to have it in the upper right corner of your image. But there are ways to fight that. The most effective one is to take an extra image with your finger in the frame covering the sun. In this case, the flare will disappear. And later, you can take this frame, put it in the Photoshop, and replace the damaged part of your master image with this additional photograph. Make sure that your camera is set to the manual mode. The exposure has to be exactly the same to, seemingly, uh, to seamlessly blend with the original image. Second issue is the difference of brightness between sky and the ground. In order to bring them in balance, you can use a graduated filter or take bracketed exposures and later merge them uh, into HDR. And if you're taking series of shots, then you have to repeat the same series with your finger in the frame, which also doubles the amount of files that you're going to end up with. Then you need to properly set up your exposure and since you are in manual mode, the best way to do that is to use our familiar histogram method. Only in this case, you need to allow uh, the histogram to slightly touch the right side because some pixels that represent the sun will go pure white and this is totally okay. We cannot find that. No camera can capture the perfect circle of the sun with all the details in it. And here I'm not even talking about more obvious tasks like uh, finding your composition, setting up your tripod, uh, focusing on the scene. And finally, this light is, it's transient and it will not last more than two minutes. And that means that, that you need to take all these steps quite fast and without proper skills, you have a risk to make a fatal mistake. Therefore, practice is crucial. Keep coming back, taking pictures, learning your mistakes, and one day you'll capture something amazing. It doesn't matter if it didn't work for the first time or 10th time, Keep practicing, keep doing this. It doesn't matter if today weather is not so good or it's boring or it's flat. Keep practicing just for that unique weather conditions. Once in a while, you'll find it and you'll be ready.
Okay. Our journey comes to the end and our final stop will be at the spectacular Black Rock. Depending on your approach, this location could be easy or difficult. The Appalachian Trail goes straight through these boulders and you can find the plethora of compositions and interesting angles staying on the trail. Or you can climb these rocks and find something less visible to the casual hiker. Everything here is covered with lichens and it makes these rocks absolutely magnificent. You can decide whether you want to take a close-up shot or an interesting pattern or frame a set of boulders in the environment or explore some shapes and cracks. Uh, but if you want to leave the trail, uh, there are two things that you should keep in mind. First, uh, climbing these rocks uh, is difficult, especially with all your camera gear. So be very careful and have proper shoes. And second, as tough as they look, these lichens are vulnerable and grow at extremely slow rate. So please watch where you step and what you touch. I personally try to find clear patches on rocks to step on and even set my tripod the way so it legs are not scrubbing off these adorable plants. So this is our travel through the park. And on that note, we came to the end and I want to thank you all for being with me on this journey through our wonderful Shenandoah. Uh, Rain, I think we have a few minutes. Right? Yeah. Thank and you we... so much, Vladimir. That was a fascinating presentation. The photographs were just beautiful too. Thank you. I do have a few thank questions. You. And if anybody else has a question, please feel free to type them in the chat box or if you'd like to ask Vladimir directly, I can unmute you. Just let me know that you uh, want to speak to him directly. Uh, so first question, what makes a good landscape photograph? Are there any elements that are a must? Uh, well, it really depends on what you personally like. Uh, I would say that there is no recipe of good landscape in terms of subject. It could be anything. Abstract can be interesting or it could be boring. Uh, sunrise could be interesting for first 10 seconds just to entertain people so they see, wow. And then this image will just fade away in their minds and they will never come back and look at it again. At the same time, the same scene in different light can be so appealing that you would want to print it and keep it on your wall for years. Um, so I would say that the best way to find best and interesting landscapes is to enjoy outdoors. If you experience uh, something that touches you, something that resonates with you, take a picture of it. This is your best, uh, I would say, bet on the good landscape photograph. Just think not about what you're going to show people, but what you would like to capture. Exclude those elements that you don't want and think on what you're actually interested in. And in most cases, you will find something unexpected. This happens to me all the time. I'm taking a picture of something that I wouldn't be looking at otherwise, but by some reason it moves me uh, and I enjoy what I'm looking at. And if I'm taking picture of it, sometimes it turns out to be much more interesting than I even anticipated. Okay, uh, next question. Hold on one second to <laughs> get back to it. Um, I am a beginner and want to learn more about the technical aspects of photography, like types of lenses, angles, etc. Do you have any recommend recommendations or resources? Uh, well, I would say that choice of lenses is so good right now. Um, 
that we can easily lost ourselves in buying gear. My advice would be to keep your lenses to minimum. I'm personally using two. I have wide angle lens uh, from 17 to 40 millimeters and one telephoto lens. Uh, and that's it. Uh, for my digital kit, I never use anything else. Um, and even more, sometimes when I go somewhere, I even leave one of these lenses behind, usually my telephoto lens, uh, and mostly work with one uh, camera and one lens uh, during one uh, photo adventure. Um, with modern quality, even kit lenses will work for you. Uh, so if you have already something, keep using it. If you question yourself whether you need new lens, you probably don't need it right now. Save this money and keep working with your camera. Once you understand that you are missing on something and you cannot do what you want to do with your current equipment, with your current lens, that means that it's time to upgrade. And by that time, you will be sure about what exactly you need. Uh, I'm using uh, Canon cameras, uh, and I started with very basic lenses, uh, basically with uh, standard kit, and then I gradually upgraded over the years. I first bought a telephoto lens, then a wide angle lens, and they were really inexpensive. Uh, they were from um, entry level uh, range. And only later, maybe like five years later or four years later, I started missing out on certain qualities that I was looking for. Uh, so uh, I don't have specific recommendations for lenses, but keeping them to minimum will help you better focus on your photography. Because I have that negative experience when I have five lenses in my backpack and I don't know what lens I want to use right now. When I'm limited with my choice, I'm thinking more about composition and what I can do with this current set that I have in my hands. Interesting. So if you're starting out, you know, go for the basic. Yes, and, just and gradually exper experimenting. Yeah. And when you when you hit a wall, you know, wow, I really want to start doing this and these lenses won't let me. That's right. That's right. And, this this is the best way. Otherwise, you will spend thousands of dollars on yeah. lenses that will be covered with dust on your shelf and you will be still <laughs> using that one single lens that you're comfortable with. Right. Got it. Okay. Any other questions for Vladimir? What kind of camera did you say you use? Um, I'm using whole set of cameras because I'm not uh, practicing digital photography, but also analog one. Oh. Uh, so I'm using uh, Canon 6D. It's a full frame can, uh, camera from Canon. Uh, but that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, so one day I decided to upgrade from a uh, crop sensor camera to the full frame camera for essentially one reason. Uh, I had wide angle lens that was not really performing well in the low light situation and i wanted to have a little bit bigger sensor but uh i would say full frame cameras are quite expensive and i waited for the time when canon announced mark ii a version of canon 6d which is basic full frame camera by itself, but when they released the new version, the older one went on sale. So I did need all the automatic features, uh, better focusing system, articulated screen, all the features. All I needed is just new sensor because I'm still using my camera in the manual mode. I'm doing everything myself. So why, do, why would I pay for uh, some video features when I'm not going to use them? And I rather save money and spend it on something more useful, like on traveling, for example, rather than spending big bucks on these expensive new camera gear. 
So that's my uh, digital equipment. Uh, I'm using a uh, medium format camera. It's called Mamiya RB67. And I'm working with large format cameras. Uh, so these big cameras with bellows that you have to set up on the tripod and use food to actually see the image on the back of the camera. Uh, Vladimir, are you doing your own printing or do you send it out or? Um, well, I'm, I'm printing my images myself. So I have Canon, uh, I think it's called Pixma or something like Pro 100. Uh, it's a great printer that is quite inexpensive uh, and produces beautiful results. So I do everything myself and it seems to be more practical uh, and not that difficult. So I save money on uh, doing everything myself and paying with my time and effort. But since I have just a few images that I want to print, uh, most of them stay digital, it is really uh, feasible to actually do this in a reasonable time and save some money. What editing software do you prefer? Uh, I use typical sets uh, that Adobe offers uh, for photographers. It costs $10 and it's set of two tools, Lightroom and Photoshop. Uh, so these are my primary tools. I do uh, basic adjustments in the Lightroom and uh, file management. So basically I organize all the files, tag them, name them, uh, do ratings and things like that. Um, if I not really careful at the location and I need to pick the horizon, this is where I'm doing this in the Lightroom. Um, then I bring these files to Photoshop uh, do my adjustments there because Lightroom is limited with layers and it's a little bit, I would say, more heavier in terms of CPU usage. So Photoshop is more preferable for me. And then I bring these files back to Lightroom and they stay there from that moment on. Okay. Any other questions for Vladimir? Okay, looks like no more questions. Good, good. All right. So, and we are what? One Seven hour? Seven thirty. Exactly an hour. Oh. We're right um, on schedule. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, anyway, thank you all so much for attending. Vladimir, you did say you had another little section. Five yes, or 10 that's right. Or so, if we have several minutes, we can quickly cover that. Uh, so, I would like to have this bonus section for us all and talk about special conditions. Um, and this is definitely about the weather. Um, when you plan your visit, uh, you usually look at the weather forecast. And I know that many people avoid going into the park when weather is not cooperating or they don't think that they will see something. And this is not always the case. Um, First uh, phenomenon that I would like to talk about is the cloud inversion. And this is actually happening when the sky is clear and you think that the skyline, uh, the sunrise will be boring because you're going to have blue sky and no texture there. So images will be not that interesting. But cloud inversion can change everything. Uh, it is that condition when you have uh, cooler air staying close to the ground and you have a uh, top layer of warm, um, I would say, uh, um, layer of warm uh, air staying atop of it. So you essentially stand in, in warm and nice, cool, well, not cool, but warm weather in mountains and you see clouds actually below you. They are in the valley and that can make beautiful setting for wonderful shots. Uh, again, I'm using my photo uh, telephoto lens to capture these clouds uh, a little bit closer. 
And I often have comments from people, how high you are? Are you in the hot air balloon or are you in the plane or something? And I'm standing on the Skyline Drive on one of the overlooks. So this is one of the conditions that I really, really enjoy. They happened uh, during the cooler mornings. So this is another reason why I live like these mornings and sunrises, because you usually cannot find this condition in the evening when the air is actually hot and everything is evaporated already. So uh, morning hours when nights are cooler, it could be middle of summer or it's frequently uh, happening uh, during the fall season or before the fall season. So September, October, and maybe first days of November. Um, so this is one uh, beautiful phenomenon. Another weather condition is ice and frost. And here, even with blue skies, uh, you can find a lot of beautiful close-ups if you look uh, into smaller pockets of shadow uh, next by rivers and waterfalls in mountains. And you can find beautiful shapes there, frozen leaves and things like that. Um, when you're looking for these scenes, keep your polarizing lens with you. Uh, because if you want to look through the eyes, polarizer can actually cut through the glare and reflection and you can see under the eyes. So it will make it transparent or you can spin it on the lens and choose the amount. So like in this example, I decided that I will use it, but not to the full extent, but just a little to see the leaves, but still retain a reflection of the blue sky. So I have this nice uh, balanced uh, image with blue and orange and they complement each other. And that's, may be something that you will be attracted to. Uh, another condition that we already talked about during the journey is fog and rain. Uh, again, I see many people staying at home and especially photographers who are saying that, well, it's drizzling, it's horrible. You have no views on overlooks. Well, you don't. But this image, for example, was taken on the overlook, looking into the different uh, direction than views because basically behind me was just like white wall of clouds and I saw nothing. But here you can take something dreamy and mystique if you want, if you drive through the park. So don't be discouraged by rain or bad weather. It can still yield in, uh, images that you really enjoy. And finally, uh, fall season. So uh, I know that we uh, often go to the park to photograph foliage, and I know that many people follow Virginia guides uh, where they track uh, the peak season. And at certain point in time, they publish announcements saying that it's a peak season in Shenandoah, and uh, people rush there, overloading entrances, parking areas, trails, and you have so many people there they run like crazy and to me it's difficult uh, because I'm trying to focus and relax and instead I'm constantly looking for a parking space or I'm competing with other people for a spot at the overlook or I'm basically just walking on the trail and I have to stop every next second because I have a traffic going toward me. Um, but there is one thing that you should keep in mind, after peak season, all these people disappear. Like you have crowds one week and next week they are gone. And in fact, I found much more interesting, uh, much more interesting pictures at that time than during the peak season, because peak season considered to be time when you have 70% of trees changing their color, which means that you still have maybe 30% uh, or one fourth of trees still green. And that means that your photos are not truly like orange and rusty colors. You still have a lot of green. And I love my pictures to be this golden and orange um, 
all the way uh, through the mountains. So coming after the peak season can actually yield very good images as well. Um, and just to highlight this, uh, I will open that image one again with the tree, this one. It was taken after the peak season and the park was empty, not just because of the weather, because people said to themselves that it's over. The fall season is done. Uh, there is nothing to see there this year. And in fact, that's what you might find there. So I really encourage you to not listen to the end of the season from all the announcement, announcements that you might hear, but still go to the park. All right, so that's the bonus section, and I think that we're definitely done on that. Okay, thank you so much, Vladimir. I think a lot of us are really excited to go to Shenandoah National Park and try some of the things you talked about tonight. Yeah, it's a great place. It's a great place. We appreciate your sharing it all with us, your experiences. Thank you all for attending tonight, and Keep your eyes on the schedule because we hope to have Vladimir back in a couple of months to do something else with us. Thank you. Have a great evening.